Coming up on this week's Salt and Sauce Chat Show. And of course, as you say, there were only three stations there. So to launch a fourth one, you were in the broadcasting history books. You know, my name is the answer to a trivial pursuit question. It was a huge deal. And I thought, I'll never get the chance to launch a TV station again. I did a pilot for a show for BBC Two with another female presenter. And the head of BBC Two loved the show, so he said yes to the show. He said yes to me, but he said no for whatever reason to the other female presenter. So I didn't know who I was going to get until I turned up on the day for the first day of rehearsal. And there was this girl I'd seen on, on the telly, Debbie Greenwood, and we got on like a house and fly. That's how we met. The rest is history. It's, it's great. You walk in the front door of the main building and there's a Dalek and a TARDIS there. So you really feel that you're part of something. And straight ahead of you through the doors, although it's separated by glass, you have to have a special thing when you pass it in, is the TV newsroom that you see during the 10 o'clock news at night or the 6 o'clock news. Yeah. The winding staircase. Welcome along to another episode of the Salt and Sauce Chat Show. I'm David Simmons and on this week's edition I am delighted to be joined by TV presenter, radio presenter, Mr Paul Coyer. Paul, thanks for coming on the show, mate. David, thank you for asking. It's a pleasure. No, it's great to have you here, mate. Um, we're going to go right back, if that's okay with you. We're going to start off in Glasgow, where you were born and raised. Um, you went on to have and still do have a very successful presenting career in front of the camera and behind it as well. Um, but let's go right back. Was that always your aim, leaving school? Were you looking to pursue that sort of career? Do you know, ever since the age of maybe four or five, when I was aware of what my dad did for a living, telly was always what I wanted to get into because my dad worked in TV. He was a lighting director at STV, so we used to go in and see all the shows he was working in. And I, I thought, oh, there's something different about this. So I always wanted to get into telly, but, you know, I always wanted to be a professional football player. I always wanted to play in a rock band. So I never knew what was going to happen. And then I went to university and got involved in the student TV there and did a stint as a director, a producer, a presenter. And when I got to the presenter bit, I thought, well, this is the easiest bit. All you have to do is open your mouth and chat, make with a gob. So I thought, that's what I'm going to do. So when I finished, I thought, right, I'll go into telly. It wasn't as easy as that because why would they take you on when you've got no experience? So I did radio first and then moved into telly. Yeah, I mean, to start off with the radio, like a lot of people do, I mean, myself included, um, before going into radio, um, I helped out at hospital radio, and that's that's where you went down as well, is that right? Yeah, I went to, well, I tell, actually, I didn't go there first. What I did was I went around clubs as a, a club DJ, and I had been working as a student on reception and as a waiter in a hotel, and there was a mobile disco came in on a Sunday. And the guy who did it, I got very friendly with, and he said, we've got a gig in the centre of Glasgow in the Ingram Hotel every Thursday, Friday, Saturday in the bar. Do you fancy doing it? I thought, yeah. Um, lots of birds there. So uh, I went and did it. And from there, I then started doing the hotel gig as well. Got so much experience that I thought, right, I'll, I'll chance one, I'll send a demo tape to Radio Clyde which I did, and almost immediately I got a letter from Andy Park, the programme controller there, asking to see me. So, of course, I thought, this is it, here we go. And we sat, and his secretary, Eva, made me a cup of tea, and I was just ready for him to throw rose petals at me and pop the champagne corks. And he said, I just wanted to put a face to the worst demo tape I have ever had the unpleasantness to hear. And I thought, oh, this isn't going exactly to plan. And he had seen me doing a gig um, for Phonogram Records. It was the launch of a Sydney Divine album. And I had been booked to do the mobile disco there. And he thought there was something that I had, but this demo tape almost convinced him that I actually didn't. So what he said was, go and do hospital radio for a while and then come back to me in about six months once you've got experience and we'll see where we go. And that's what I did. And so was it the same programme controller that you went back to six months later and, and got the move into Radio Clyde? Was it the same guy? 
Yeah, what I did, well, I was quite fortunate because I was told, see, I thought in my arrogance, naivety, whatever, I thought when he said that, go and join hospital radio, you just turn up and they stick you on the air. But they quite rightly say, well, hang on a minute, you've got to earn that. So I spent months going out to hospitals in my car, collecting requests, looking out the records for the presenters, doing all the studio stuff, everything except getting in front of a microphone, which teaches you A, how it works, but B, a bit of humility. And the people I was working with there, one of them, Ken Bruce was leaving. Ken, I think, was selling paint at the time. And he had got a gig at BBC Scotland. So suddenly, through him, I met a lot of people in radio. And so when I sent the tape to Andy Park again six months later, I had a few contacts by then. And thank God he listened to it again. And he offered me an overnight Saturday into Sunday every weekend. Brilliant. There we go. That's how you get your move into radio. I mean, from commercial radio, you then managed to start appearing on our TV screens. This was initially as a continuity presenter, wasn't it? Yeah. I, well, actually, no, before that, what had happened was at Radio Clyde, I moved from doing through the night, Saturday into Sunday, to doing weekends. I did the chart show, and I did a kids show on a Saturday morning, but they said, look, we'll give you three hours, play requests, do whatever the heck you want. So I called it the Saturday morning alarm show, Smash. And it, it proved to be very popular because of the music, I guess. Uh, you know, which was all kids wanted to hear, the pop hits, but also some classics. And there was a guy who did a comedy show on Radio Clyde at the time, uh, Clem Dane. And Clem said to me, you know, you should be getting into telly. I said, well, I don't know how to do that. My dad's in that said, but I don't want him to know because people will think he's pulling strings. He said, just leave it with me. And about two weeks later, I got a phone call at Radio Clyde from the Glenn Michael Cavalcade, the cartoon Cavalcade show. Right. And they said, we've had a couple of letters from fans of yours asking if they can see what you look like. Do you want to come on the Glenn Michael show? And I went, yeah. So I went on, I pulled some winners out of a hat, and I gave a rub to Paladin the Lamp. Do you remember Paladin the Lamp? I think so, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. And um, and that was it. Uh, and I merrily toddled off. And then maybe a month later, the program controller at STV got in touch with me and said, we're looking for a new continuity announcer. Saw you in Glenn Michaels' Cavalcade. Do you want to come in and audition? So I did, and I got the job. It was only after that that Clem Dane said to me, he said, see, I told you. And I said, well, that was quite a coincidence. He said, what do you mean coincidence? He'd gone around these neighbours and got them all to send letters into Glenn Michaels' Cavalcade saying we want your old coil and see what he looks like. Brilliant. So God bless him. Ah, that's superb. And you went on to do the, the Paul Coyer show on STV as well, was that right? Hey, the first one I did was called Meet Paul Coyer, right. which was, uh, it was done at the Gateway Theatre in Edinburgh, and I was terrified, which is some great guests on it, uh, Spandau Valley, loads of, of bands that I really liked, uh, Kirsty McCall, I had, um, oh, what's her name, uh, oh, why have I forgotten, Joan Collins' sister, the one who was writing all the novels, she came on, so we had brilliant guests on it, and I was a bit nervous. But anyway, we finished recording it. I went off to America with my mates on holiday and they started putting the shows out. And the first show went out with the wrong soundtrack. So there was no applause, no laughter from the audience. Apparently it was just a car crash. I've never seen it. Uh, so the reviews that first week, John Miller in the Daily Record, he just put the title of the show, Meet Paul Coya. And underneath it, his review was, no thanks. Uh -huh. And so when I came back to this and thought, that, that's it over. That, I, you know, I've got to go somewhere else. So I applied for a job in London and moved to London. But then they revived the chat show and I did several more series for STV and for Grampian. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure you get asked this quite a lot as well. But w one of the, the huge accolades is, is back in 1982, uh, you were the UK's first voice on Channel 4. It wasn't the, the case where you had Netflix, YouTube, all that. It was BBC One, BBC Two. ITV, that was your lot, and then 1982, along came Channel 4, and you were the first voice on it. That must have been a, a huge honour and pressure, given that job. Well, it was all of those things and more, because I gave up having... I had just very, very luckily won the title of Scottish Radio Personality of the Year. I had my own weekly TV chat show, 
And I gave it all up to move to London to be an announcer, somebody who was almost never going to be seen. So I had actually turned the clock back and gone back to where I started because I thought, well, you know, this chat show is getting lousy reviews, so I need to try elsewhere. So I did go to London. I got the job. I applied for three jobs. And the first one that came through was as an announcer at Channel 4. And I didn't know I was going to open the station. It was only after we started working leading up to the launch that my boss took me aside and said, we'd like you to be the first voice. And of course, as you say, there were only three stations there. So to launch a fourth one, you were in the broadcasting history books. You know, my name is the answer to a trivial pursuit question. It was a huge deal. And I thought, I'll never get the chance to launch a TV station again, which was wrong because with satellite came loads more stations and I've actually launched another couple. But in terms of the size of that, the fact that the whole global press corps were there, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, you name it, they were in the building when we launched the station. Oh, it was mega. Was Huge. So no. Yeah, I mean, do you have any idea how many people tuned in for that launch? Have you any idea off the top of your head, or do you recall the... My mum, my dad, uh, <laughs> and sister. Now, I, I, it was a big, big deal, but Channel 4 never got huge audiences. Channel 4 still doesn't have huge audiences, let's be honest. But when we did the launch of the, sh the channel, I remember Jeremy Isaacs, our boss, he said that he was aiming for us to get 10%. Of the audience. Now, before I left, eight months after the launch, I think we had never got more than two, two and a half percent. Oh, really? People weren't in the habit of listening to Channel 4 then. And also, Channel 4 launched as something different. So we had really heavy documentaries, really heavy RT discussions about books and weird independent cinema. Um, it wasn't something you would watch for comfort. And so it was a difficult sell, I must be honest. Yeah, I mean, you never hung about at Channel 4 very long. You, you, you moved on and you actually filled in on a show for um, Starsky and Hutch's very own David Soul, is that right? I did, I did. And the reason I didn't hang around, I would have hung around, but I had been promised that I could present some shows and it never happened. So I thought, well, you know, I've turned the clock back I've taken a gamble. I've come down here for less than half my salary. Plus, I was paying rent in London, which I wasn't yeah. doing in Glasgow. So I thought, I can't keep this going. Um, I got an agent. She got me an audition and then the job, as you say, filling in for um, Hutch. Star is it Starsky or is it Hutch? David, um, David so I can't remember. Whichever one he was. One of them. Uh, filling in for him. Uh, on a show called 655, which was a summer network magazine BBC Two show from Pebble Mill. It was great. Yeah. And that progressed to you getting a, a more permanent slot on Pebble Mill as well. Uh, Pebble Mill one, sorry. Uh, I'll be honest, it was before my time. I've never seen it, but I've watched back a few clips knowing that we were going to have a discussion about it. And right. it, it does, it looks very much like uh, a setup that you would see today, but maybe back then, if that makes sense. I'm thinking, like, I think you've said this on other interviews as well, the one show this morning. Would that be a, a fair comparison? Yeah. I mean, I watched Pebble Mill when I was at school. And I, you know, if I was off sick, and I wasn't aware of the fact it was different because it was so professional. But when I think about it logically, there was no other show, never had been, where you did a magazine show, but you could see through the glass. There wasn't a wall behind the presenters. You could see through out to the road. You could see people walking by and cars going up and down. Well, that's the same now with the one show. It's the same now with this morning. Whoever started that Pebble Mill at one in the foyer at Pebble Mill was a genius because he or she used up this space that was big and not being used on them for, for people sitting around waiting for appointments and turned it into a studio at almost no cost and got a network show out of it. Well, then came this morning, then came the one show afterwards. But they started it. Whoever came up with that, they started it. It was brilliant. Yeah, that's no, a great concept. Uh, you went on to present like lots of quiz shows, Split Second, Catchword and, and Spellbound. Um, there was loads more as well. Was there a favourite of yours that you enjoyed doing? <laughs> well, the one I think I enjoyed doing initially, but I didn't enjoy doing towards the end, was Catchword. 
And the reason I enjoyed it was because, initially, it was because I had come to the end of the time at Pebble Mill. There was a guy, I won't mention his name, who had been appointed to the BBC who decided that Pebble Mill at one was too expensive. So he brought in something else to replace it, but he bought in. Uh, and I, we were all out of a job. And God bless him. The head of Pebble Mill, the big BBC boss, phoned around all the BBC stations to say, I've got these presenters, I think they're great, find them a job. Wow. And then BBC Scotland rang me and said, well, Giles Brandreth has been doing this local show for us, but it's going network, he's not available, do you want to do it? So I came up and I just felt so chuffed that I'd gone from one network show to another. And I had the chance to make it my own, to mould it to what I felt I was good at. And so that went on but it went on for me to the stage where it was so successful that we were knocking off maybe eight or nine shows a day and i was just getting exhausted so towards the end after eight years i was ready to say thank you but time to move on yeah i mean what one of the game shows i mentioned was spellbound now that was sky one's game show uh used to i always remember it used to get a game card um in your free <laughs> sky tv magazine that you could play along with um yeah. I mean, that was maybe, if, I, if I'm being honest, in my opinion, the, the first sort of interactive play-along home quiz show, if you like. Um, do, do you recall the lousy letters and the starter words and stuff like that? <laughs> yeah, a good memory. Um, yes, but the weird thing about that show, it, it was devised by a guy called Stephen Leahy, who was the man who'd come up with the idea for the Krypton Fact and various other quizzes. So we had tested it to disruption and it worked and it was great. And Stephen threw in this, as you say, this game card within the magazine, match the letters, phone in live to Paul and you could win some money. Great. Except the big, big, big shiny floor studio that we used at Granada, um, it wouldn't have been cost effective to do that every day just to get the live phone call. So what we did was we knocked off three series. I was recording eight shows a day, I think, of that. And what would happen is we would tailor it, I don't know if you remember, to a specific day. So if it was Burns Night, I would wear a kilt or something like that. If it was Valentine's Day, we'd talk about love and Valentine's. But we recorded three series. So we were actually towards the end looking three years ahead. And then what happened was we rebuilt a tiny bit of the studio at Sky and on the recorded bit from three years before, two years before, one year before, it was built in that I would say, right, well done, David, you're in the lead of so-and-so points. We'll be back for round two after I go and take a phone call. And I would walk off and then appear live in the same clothes, take the phone call and then walk back on. Now, it worked seamlessly. It was brilliant, apart from two, th three things, actually. One, sometimes if it was a big, big global event, the show didn't go out. It was put off to the next day. So suddenly all the, oh, it's Valentine's Day. Actually, it's not. That was two days ago. Or why is he wearing a kilt? It's not Burns Night anymore. That kind of thing crept in. Secondly, the wardrobe mistress lost some of my clothes. So stuff that I'd done three years before didn't match. And I had to come in with something like, say, a green jacket, a jacket that was roughly the shade of green. And what I had to do was walk in live, take it off and say, it's warm in here, <laughs> take phone call, and then go, right, I'm going over to see the other contestants, get up, grab the jacket, and start putting it on as I walked off, so that when it cut to the recorded stuff, I was in the jacket again. And the third thing that went wrong was that one day I got food poisoning and I was rushed to A&E. And when the show was about to go into rehearsal for that little live bit, we always did about half an hour rehearsal for it, I was lying on a gurney in a hospital. So rather than lose the show, they phoned up Debbie, my wife, and said, hmm, Paul's doing something for us at the moment. He's a bit busy. So we don't have a host for tonight's show. Do you fancy coming in and doing it? She went, yeah. So they sent a taxi. She went in and all in the live bit. So on the pre-record bit, I'm saying, right, David, you're in the lead. We'll be back for round two after I go and take a live phone call. I walk off, cut live to Debbie. She's going, no, you don't. I'm your wifey. You stay there. Do what you're told. I'm going to do this. And she took the phone call, and then she said, right, let's hand back to Paul. Now, you can do it. Great. 
So Sorry. we went out, and it was only after we came off air, or she came off air, that they told her actually her husband was lying in the A and E, throwing his guts up, and had been unconscious for about half an hour. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> so much go on, eh? Absolutely, Absolutely. that's showbiz. <laughs> Um, I, I mean, I remember that well. I remember my mum having kittens when the one month's episode of the, the Sky Mag never come through the letterbox. Uh, so I do remember that well. But we've touched on your, your radio career, your, your presenting on TV game shows. Um, one thing I need to talk to you about as well is the holiday episode of Rabsy Nisbet. Um, <laughs> you, you played you played the over-enthusiastic holiday rep called Andy. Uh, everybody was bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. Yes, Andy. Uh, what's your memories of, of filming that episode with the likes of Gregor Fisher, Elaine C. Smith, Tony Roper and the crew? It was just a blast, a complete blast. They'd already been recording that. that we were, we were in Palma, Mallorca. I think we were in Palma. I might be wrong. I might be somewhere on mainland Spain. I don't know. But um, I flew out and they'd already recorded some scenes. And of course, they'd done so many series together before. So I thought, oh, you know, I'm, I'm the new boy here. They might not be welcoming. But they were, and we had such a laugh over the days. And uh, we had no rehearsal. Uh, the, the director, Colin Gilbert, is brilliant. He just said, oh, do what you want to do. He said, you know the words. He said, just be, go and be obnoxious. Be a bit oily. I thought, oh, great, OK. So um, I looked at the script, and uh, there was wee Bernie, where, you know, when I'm going, uh, you know, uh, is everyone all right or whatever? And they go, all oh, right. I go, yes, Andy. And he would go sod off, Andy. And I just thought, this is brilliant. You know, I'm getting paid for this. Couldn't believe yeah. it. It was wonderful. There's a bit of a family running joke with, with my family because I think it, that must have been early 90s. I think it was maybe about 95, 96. We went to Santa Ponza as a family. Right. And th who's, what's the name of the holiday rep that's that's showing us around? Andy. My. Absolutely. Oh. My mum and dad ran with that for the full two weeks. Yes, Andy. So I had to bring that up to you, mate. I had to bring it up. Oh, I must apologise. When I arrived, um, uh, Eric Cullen, who played me, Bernie, was in the makeup room lying flat down having his bum shaved. And uh, the makeup girl had had a phone call from the other hotel with the swimming pool where we were recording, saying that the scenes the day before showed him as an adult rather than as the teenager he was supposed to be, because he had a hairy bum. So could they shave his bottom? So that was my introduction to Eric Cullen, to me, Bernie, was him lying down getting his bum shaved. And then he and I got on the bus to go down to the hotel and he was mad fuming at the humiliation of it. When he got off the bus, he really remonstrated with Colin Gilbert, the director, who didn't have a clue of what he was talking about. It turned out it was Tony Roper who phoned up his person from <laughs> Colin Gilbert and got Wee Bernie's bottom shade just for a laugh. <laughs> so, how could you not enjoy that? It was brilliant. Superb. Um, you mentioned your wife, uh, Debbie, Debbie Greenwood. Uh, she was a uh, former Miss Great Britain and she worked on QVC as well as a presenter. Um, you mentioned how she stood in for you on that game show. Did you meet through the that line of work? We did. I had seen it before because she used to co-present the BBC Breakfast Show with Selena Scott and Frank Boff and people like that. Uh, but we'd never met. And then I did a pilot for a show for BBC Two with another female presenter. And the head of BBC Two loved the show, so he said yes to the show. He said yes to me, but he said no for whatever reason to the other female presenter. So I didn't know who I was going to get until I turned up on the day for the first day of rehearsal, and there was this girl I'd seen on, on the telly, Debbie Greenwood, and we got on like a house on fire, and that's how we met. And the rest history. Yes. <laughs> well, <literally. laughs> well, not for me, for her. <laughs> Um, what are you doing just now? Are you presenting on BBC London, is that right? Right, so I do radio shows for BBC Radio London and BBC Radio Barcher, and um, that's great. The BBC London one's a phone-in type thing. The Radio Barcher one is on a Sunday morning, so we cover a bit of faith, and then between 9 and 10 we take a different topic, and I get celebrity guests on to talk about their life, basically, what they're up to. It could be soap stars, pop stars, whatever. I love it. It's great. Brilliant. I mean, BBC London, uh, BBC Radio London, sorry, it broadcast from the new state-of-the-art BBC uh, studios in London. We obviously touched on the one show. I believe that's in there as well. What, what's it like working in, in that new state-of-the-art building? 
it's it's great. You walk in the front door of the main building and there's a Dalek and a TARDIS there, so you really feel that you're part of something. And straight ahead of you through the doors, although it's separated by glass, you have to have a special thing on your pass it in, is the TV newsroom that you see during the 10 o'clock news at night or the 6 o'clock news, yeah. the winding staircases. Um, so you can then walk through to the bit where BBC Radio London is. Directly below that is the One Show Studio. The One Show Studio sits underneath directly the studio where you would do Radio London from. And then you can go down to the canteen, and on the canteen level is where the studio is, where the newsreaders sit, and you can see over the shoulder into the newsroom. So, of course, you know, being a telly now, I've been in there, had my picture taken, sitting at New Edwards' desk and, and just loving it. And all the meeting rooms are named after Morecambe and Wise or Joel Dando or all the greats of the past. So you don't say, I'll see you in meeting room two, you just say, all right, um, I'll see you in Only Fools and Horses or something like that. And it's, it's just a lovely atmosphere. Yeah. Really. I mean, is there, a, is there a peel wing? It's called John Peel Wing. Is there something like that? Well, that's the other entrance. So the right. peel wing holds the um, studio for the one show and Radio London on top of that. And then above it is Radio One Extra and the Asian network, I think. And so you can go in the peel wing door entrance, which is opposite the statue of George Orwell. I don't know if you've noticed during the COVID thing, the health correspondent always does his graphs against this marble wall outside. That's directly opposite the entrance to the Peel Wing. And then right. di directly across the road from that is Wogan House, where Radio 2 is. So you can go in there or you can go in the main door just to see the Daleks. Obviously, I always go for the Daleks. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you also work uh, for, as a like a presenter coach don't you like a mentor you coach and um, people to do public speaking uh, is that the case and and if so what what sort of impact has that line of work had with the whole covid pandemic decimated it it's it's gone well no it's not all gone i mean i do quite a bit on zoom but mm. you know, it's not quite the same as being in the same room as somebody and and helping them and also a lot of what I do in teaching business leaders to speak is at conferences. Well, there are no conferences because you can't let the public in. For instance, uh, for the past few years, I've coached all the speakers for the BT conference at the NEC in Birmingham. Now, that would involve weeks of rehearsals and coaching people. Then we go and it takes place over four or five days because they bus in maybe, oh, I don't know how many thousands of employees every day to see this conference. Well, that obviously can't take place and multiply that by all the other number of conferences. So that's disappeared. Um, so it has made things quite difficult. On the other hand, being able to do it on Zoom, I was coaching the managing director of a company in Ecuador. Mm -hmm. Now, I would never have been able to do that before Zoom came along in the pandemic. So I suppose there are pluses and minuses, but overall, no, it's definitely, devastating the way not just people like me have lost that kind of work but obviously if you think of the conferences all the sound guys have lost their work all the lighting yeah. guys have lost their work the scenery block um the logistics people the drivers the hotels that put up all the people who are going to the conference the nec itself all the venues it's heartbreaking it really is yeah i mean i take it you're looking to return to that line of work um, once this hopefully all blows over yeah oh yeah because it's wonderful. You know, I've, I've coached people for the maiden speech in the House of Lords. That's fantastic. In fact, the guy I did that uh, with most recently, he sent me a copy of Hansard where his speech was reported. And he signed this copy of Hansard for me and he put, look at page whatever. And I turned to that page and he'd ring this bit where whoever stood up after him had said, that was the best speech ever and you were magnificent and all that. But then he'd added at the end, don't get a big head, they all have to say this. Um, so it's lovely to work with people and get that kind of little memento and work with our clients all over the world. It's just, it's just superb. So the sooner we can get back to it, the better. Yeah, I love it, I love it. Absolutely. I mean, I've done a lot of interviews with a lot of different people, mainly football players recently, and I've been saying to them, if you could go back and relive 90 minutes of a game, 
what, what game would you choose? So my question to you, Paul, is if you could go back maybe a time in your life where you were either on Radio Clyde on another radio station or presenting a certain show, which which time would you go back to? Um, it would, well, it would be with Pebble Mill at one, and it would either be a time that we spent in New York where I got on the set of so many TV shows to interview all these stars of American comedies. I interviewed the New York mayor. I interviewed bands who were traveling through. Almost got, almost got to interview Whitney Houston, but she was sick on the day. It was just, I was starstruck. It would either be that, or again for Pebble Mill, it would be on the island of Mahi in the Seychelles, where one afternoon in the filming, we got an afternoon off. Myself and the sound guy and the cameraman were by the pool. Just, we couldn't believe our luck getting paid to be under palm trees with this beautiful swimming pool. And I said to the guys, and I promise you this is true, I said, guys, life doesn't get better than this. And with perfect timing, Miss Scotland, Miss Wales, and Miss Ireland appeared topless and jumped in the swimming pool, swam over and started talking to us. So we piled up for the week. Doesn't get better than that. That's superb. And that, what a way to end the interview. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Paul Coyer. Pleasure, David. Thank you so much.